Okay, so welcome to today's lecture on scattering theory. I would um, like to start with the basic principles of scattering in Hilbert spaces. Basic principles of scattering in Hilbert spaces. which is the topic for today. So let um, H be a Hilbert space. And I take a sequence, a n, for n in n, of bounded operators on the Hilbert space H, and an operator A in L of H, so this here denotes the bounded operators on the Hilbert space H. Then I say that A n converges weakly to A if and only if the forms A n, F, G converge to A, F, G. And this holds true for all f and g in the Hilbert space H. We say that a n converges strongly to a if and only if a n f converges in uh, the norm of the Hilbert space to a f for any f in H. And we say that a n converges to a in norm if and only if the operator norm of a n minus a. And um, you might recall that this is defined as the supremum of the set of norm a n minus a applied to f for norm f smaller than or equal to 1 if this converges to 0 for n to infinity. And when we consider these three notions of convergence, we have the following um, chain of implications. We know that norm convergence of course, implies the strong convergence and the strong convergence implies weak convergence. Which is directly clear from my definitions here. Okay. We will also see that for the purposes of scattering theory, the strong convergence is actually what we will need. We will see this um, in a few moments. Then lemma 2.1. I take operators a n, b n for n element n and a b, bounded operators on the Hilbert space H. And I um, uh, assume that a n converges to a and b n converges to b strongly. Then I claim that um, the, that the operator a n b n converges strongly to a b. Yeah, this is um, easy to prove. So let's have a look at the proof here. And the uniform boundedness principle implies that um, there is a constant C, non-negative, such that the norms of the AN are bounded by this 
constant C for any n in n. Yeah, and then we can do the following here. <clears throat> we can consider the difference a n b n applied to some element f. Um, and I want to consider the, the difference here taken with a b f in norm, and I can add in zero in the following form minus a n b f plus a n b f. And then I can apply the um, triangle inequality to obtain that this can be estimated by norm a n b n f minus a n b f. These are the first two summons here, plus um, the norm of and here I have a n b f minus a b f. And then I can um, go on and estimate in the following way. I have here the norm of a n minus a b f. OK, here I've changed the order of the two summons. Plus, and in the second term, norm a n times the norm um, of um, B n minus B f. Yeah, and here we know that um, the first term converges to zero because a n converges strongly to a, and also this sum and here converges to zero because B n converges strongly to B, and these here are bounded by C, so we see that um, the whole right-hand side converges to zero, and then we have um, what we stated here. So this already completes the proof of the lemma. OK, let's go on. And let's consider unbounded operators. H, again, is a Hilbert space, and I consider an operator A an unbounded operator, and you know that uh, this is defined on a domain, D of A, um, in H, should be self-adjoint. And then I would like to recall what the spectral theorem says. The spectral theorem says that A has a representation in the following way. It can be written as a so-called spectral integral in the following way. A is the integral over lambda d e of lambda, and these operators e of lambda have um, the following properties. e of lambda for any lambda in R is a bounded operator. Um, and the operators are projections, meaning that e of lambda to the power of 2 is e of lambda is e of lambda star. And um, this family is called um, a spectral family. And the spectral theorem also says that this representation is unique. Yeah? So given a self-adjoint operator A, we have a unique spectral family such that this representation holds true. And I would also like to recall the three important uh, properties of spectral families, because we will need this in the following. So it's important to keep it in mind. First of all, monotonicity, meaning that if lambda is smaller than or equal to mu, then the operator E of lambda is smaller than or equal to E of mu in the usual sense of quadratic, quadratic forms. Second property is the strong right continuity. Meaning that for any lambda in R and for any f in the Hilbert space H, 
we have that um, E of lambda plus epsilon applied to F converges to E of lambda F when we send epsilon to zero. And the third and last property here, we have that E of lambda F converges to F for lambda to infinity and E of lambda F goes to zero for lambda to minus infinity and this holds true for all F in the Hilbert space H. Yeah, I would uh, finally like to um, comment on this um, representation formula here. What do we mean by this um, uh, representation? We mean that if I consider the form A applied to phi and in the product with psi, then this is nothing but the integral lambda de of lambda phi psi for any phi in the domain of A and for any psi in the Hilbert space. And in fact here this integral um, ranges over the spectrum of the operator A and then this is a usual riemann stieltjes integral. Furthermore, also let's say this is formula 2.1 because we will need it in the following. Um, furthermore, the function lambda goes to scalar product E of lambda phi phi and by the properties of the spectral family, this is nothing but E of lambda phi to the power of two um, is um, a spectral measure, is a spectral measure and I denote it by um, mu phi. This is the spectral measure associated with the vector phi um, in the Hilbert space H. Yeah, and furthermore, the spectral theorem also says that um, given a spectral family, there is um, a, a self-adjoint operator A, a unique operator A, which is then given by this representation. So also the converse statement holds true. Yeah. So the spectral theorem also says um, a given a spectral family uh, E of lambda lambda in R, then there, exists, then there exists a unique self-adjoint operator A such that A is the spectral integral lambda DE of lambda. Yeah, furthermore, using the spectral theorem, um, we can define functions of operators. This is the next thing that I would like to consider. Functions of operators. And first of all, I would like to discuss the bounded case. So assume that A is a bounded operator. And um, yeah, then there is a functional calculus in the following sense. Um, we find a map phi from the continuous functions on the spectrum of A to the bounded operators L of H, which is also unique such that the following properties are satisfied. First of all, phi is an algebraic star homomorphism. It 
in the following sense. If I apply phi to a product of functions f and g, then I get phi of f, phi of g. Second property, phi of lambda f is lambda phi of f. Phi of the function 1 gives the identity operator. And phi of the complex conjugate of f is phi of f star. The second property two uh, phi is continuous in the following sense the norm of phi of f in L of H can be estimated by constant norm of f in the infinity norm. And the third property is um, if I consider the function f um, given by f of x is equal to x, then phi of f yields the operator a. And we write um, using this map phi, phi of f is f of a. The function f applied to the operator a and f of a then acts in the following sense. The quadratic form f of a um, for the vector phi is nothing but the integral over the spectrum of a f of lambda d mu phi for all phi in the Hilbert space H. Yeah, and it's also possible, of course, to um, have such a calculus for unbounded operators. In this case, you have to modify um, the setting a little bit. For example, you consider the um, bounded Borel functions here, and then you construct a map um, phi hat, for example, with quite similar properties. So it's also possible to do this, and I would um, like to refer to Reed and Simon's book here for further details. So um, this works similarly for unbounded operators. And um, you should look this up in Reed Simon, volume one. Yeah, let's uh, consider some examples. Maybe we can do it here. Some examples. The first one is the group exponential of minus i t a for t and r. This um, um, gives us a strongly continuous unitary group as we will see even today. And um, if I define a function u of t by applying this exponential minus i t a to some initial value u0, let's say in some L2 space, for example, then this gives a solution. So this here is a solution to um, the Schrödinger equation, to the Schrödinger equation provided the operator A is a Schrödinger operator minus Laplace plus some potential V. Another example 
maybe on the other blackboard. I can also consider the group um, E of minus TA for T non-negative and also A non-negative. This is a strongly continuous semi-group. And um, I can define a function v of t by applying this exponential here to some initial value v0. Then this is a solution to the heat equation provided a is a self-adjoint um, realization of the minus Laplace operator. Yeah, and two further examples, which you also might know, I can consider characteristic functions associated with intervals, for example, of this type, and then this yields in the spectral projections associated with these intervals. So uh, here I get E of B minus E of A. And yeah, a typical example, which you also might know, is the square root of a non-negative non operator, square root of A, can be obtained by yeah, precisely this approach. So this is a square root operator. OK. The next thing that I would like to recall is um, uh, yeah, how can we decompose the spectrum of a self-adjoint operator. Yeah? So I would like to discuss um, decompositions of um, the spectrum. And um, there are three decompositions that are important for our purposes. So the spectrum of A, first of all, can be decomposed in the way that we have the point spectrum of A in the union with the continuous spectrum of A and with the residual spectrum of A. This is um, decomposition 2.2. Yeah, but there are two other decompositions that are important. I can also decompose in the following sense. I can have the discrete spectrum of A and the essential spectrum of A, which is the decomposition 2.3. And I can have uh, the decomposition sigma pure point of A in the intersection with uh, the absolutely continuous spectrum of A and the singularly continuous spectrum of A, which is here 2.4. Yeah, to obtain um, the first decomposition here, one considers, as you know, the operator a minus lambda and the equation applied to some u is equal to zero. Yeah, and then one checks whether there is a non-trivial element u um, such that this relation is true. If this is the case, um, the value lambda is in the point spectrum. And in this case, um, of course, the operator A minus lambda is not injective. This is the first case. And um, the two other parts of the spectrum um, yeah, uh, consider the case when the operator A minus lambda is in injective, but it is not surjective. And then two possibilities um, can occur. We can have that um, the range of A minus lambda is dense in the Hilbert space, or it is not dense in the Hilbert space. 
and these two cases refer to those components of the spectrum. Of course, um, the range of A minus lambda cannot be equal to the Hilbert space because then the operator would be surjective and when it's injective and surjective, we are in the resolvent set. So we are not in the spectrum anymore. Yeah, and for self-adjoint operators, one also knows that this um, uh, part of the spectrum is empty. So for self-adjoint operators, we only have the decomposition into the, the point spectrum and the continuous spectrum. And one also knows that um, the point spectrum uh, corresponds precisely to the discontinuities of the spectral family. Yeah? So um, the spectral family E of lambda has discontinuities at values belonging to the point spectrum and um, the spectral family is strongly continuous um, at values belonging to the continuous spectrum. Yeah. And here, uh, the decomposition 2.3 um, uh, works in the following way. Um, lambda is in the discrete spectrum of A. Yeah, if and only if lambda is an eigenvalue of um, finite multiplicity, uh, which is an isolated point of the spectrum. Yeah, so this means that um, we have zero is smaller than the dimension of the kernel of A minus lambda, which is finite. And furthermore, there exists epsilon positive, such that the spectrum of A intersected with the interval from lambda minus epsilon to lambda plus epsilon is only the, is the single value lambda. Yeah, and consequently, the essential spectrum comprises eigenvalues of um, infinite uh, multiplicity or uh, accumulation points of the spectrum. Yeah. And it's also important to um, see that these um, decompositions here are disjoint. The last composition, decomposition is not disjoint um, and it um, is derived in the following way. Uh, consider a function f on the real line which is uh, monotonic. Then Lebesgue found out that um, f can be decomposed in the following way. There is a jump function fpp, an absolutely continuous function fac, and a singular continuous function fsc. This is a famous result of Lebesgue. And of course, this can be applied to, um, uh, to, uh, to functions obtained from spectral families. So consider a spectral family uh, E of lambda for lambda and R. And um, then the function lambda is sent to E of lambda phi phi is monotonic. by the monotonicity property of E of lambda. And from this, we get um, a decomposition of the spectral measure, which results in a decomposition of the Hilbert space and finally of the spectrum. So um, let's define the following closed subsets of the Hilbert space. First of all, the space HPP, which I define as the closure of the following linear span, the span of all U in the domain of A, of course, non-zero, such that there exists a value lambda in R, satisfying A, U, A applied to U is lambda U, and I take the closure to obtain a closed subset of H. Yeah, so here I have um, the eigenvalues, um, and I consider the linear span, and I take the closure of this. And A, of course, is, uh, is the, the operator, which is the spectral integral 
um, lambda de of lambda. And I define the subspace HAC by the set of all F in H such that E of lambda applied to F and this in the norm to the power of two is absolutely continuous. And um, finally, similarly, the space HSC, the set of all F in H, such that this uh, spectrum measure here is singularly continuous. And then I get uh, a decomposition of the Hilbert space in the following way, I can decompose H as HPP direct sum with HAC and HSC. Furthermore, um, yeah, let's uh, say it again here, HPP, H AC and H, SC are closed. Subspaces of H that reduce A. That reduce the operator A in the following sense. If I take a projection P, which is either the projection on HPP or HAC or HSC, then it holds true that PA is extended by AP. Yeah, by this... Um, Expression, I mean that for u in the domain of A, um, pu is again in the domain of A, and we have then um, the equality pau is equal to apu. This is meant by this formula here. And if I take a set M, which is either HPP, or H A C or H S C, then I can define operators in the following sense. They have a domain D of A M. So then this is the domain of my operator A M that I would like to define, um, which is then defined by the domain of A in the intersection with the set M for one of these components here, and I define the operator AM simply by saying that it should be AU for all U in the domain of this AM. Then I obtain operators in um, the component M for M um, equal to one of these three possibilities here. And finally, I can define the following spectra. I have uh, the spectrum sigma pp of A. This is um, given by the set of all lambda in R, such that there exists u in the domain of A non-zero, such that A u is lambda u. And again, I have to take the closure of this set and I define um, the absolutely continuous spectrum of A simply by the spectrum of A, H, A, C. This operator is defined in the following sense here, and sigma S, C of A is similarly sigma of A, H, S, C. 
And this then yields the decomposition 2.3. Oh, sorry. It should be 2.4, which you find on the other blackboard. OK. The next thing that I would like to recall um, are some effects on strongly continuous unitary groups. So strongly continuous unitary groups. Uh, we consider a family of unitary operators, ut for t in R, should be a family of unitary operators. And I assume that they satisfy the following two properties. First of all, u of t plus s is equal to u of t u of s for all s and t in R. And second property, u of tn applied to some f converges strongly to u of uh, to u t zero applied to f for all f in the Hilbert space H in the strong sense so strongly provided t n converges to t zero for n to infinity and then I would like to recall two very fundamental theorems on um, strongly continuous unitary groups. And we do it on the other blackboard. Um, here we have theorem 2.2. Uh, so let A be a self-joint um, operator in the Hilbert space H. Um, with the spectral family E of lambda. So A is the spectral integral lambda d E of lambda. Then this theorem says, first of all, um, if I define operators u of t by taking the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, exponential of i lambda t, the e of lambda, this operator is unitary for any t, for any t in r, And furthermore, the family u of t for t in R is a strongly continuous unitary group. And this family is a strongly continuous unitary group. Second statement here, number two, for any psi in the domain of A, we have that the limit for t to zero, one over t, u of t, psi minus psi is equal to I A psi. And the third property, if this limit here exists, if this limit exists, then the element psi is 
in the domain of A. Yeah, exists, of course, for psi and H, clearly. Then psi is in the domain of A. Okay, and also very important theorem 2.3. which is Stone's theorem. And it says, let u of t for t in R be a strongly continuous unitary group. then there is a unique self-adjoint operator A, then there exists a unique self-adjoint operator A, such that U of T is exponential of I T A for T in R, and we say then that the operator A generates this um, group U of T. It's the generator then of this group. Okay, finally, let's come to quantum mechanics. And let us consider a quantum mechanical particle that moves in a potential V. And you know that in this case, the dynamics of such a system is given by the Schrödinger equation, which reads DDT F of a spatial variable and T is equal to one over I H f of the spatial variable and t. This is my equation 2.5. And an initial condition f of a variable n0 is equal to some f0. This is 2.6. And the operator h is a Schrödinger operator minus Laplace plus a potential V in L2. Let's say in L2 of Rd. And we also assume that the norm of F0 is equal to 1. OK. We go on. Um, when we discuss the motion of a quantum mechanical particle in a potential V given by the Schrödinger equation, then um, the integral of the function f of x and t to the power of 2 integrated with respect to the space variable x over a set q this gives the probability, this is the probability to find the particle, to find the particle in the set Q, which is a subset of RD, and which should be measurable. at time t. At time t. And furthermore, of course, the integral over Rd of f of x and t to the power of 2 is then equal to 1. This, of course, is um, clear from the fact that um, this exponential of um, e minus t um, and the Schrödinger operator H, this is a unitary group. 
and we assumed that um, the L2 norm of the F1, uh, F0 is equal to 1. Yeah, and the fact that this um, um, evolution group is unitary, of course, then implies that also this has to hold true. And of course, it has to hold true because of this physical interpretation here. Yeah, so this, of course, has to hold true. Ah, sorry, I've forgotten to explain in advance that the solution to um, 2.5 and 2.6, which was the initial value problem for the Schrödinger equation, is given in the following way. Sorry, I was one step too fast. Is given in this way here for any t in R. And now you can understand my argument. We assumed that the L2 norm of F0 is equal to 1, and we know that this group here is unitary. So this here is then clear because of the fact that this exponential group is unitary. Yeah? And of course, it also fits to the physical interpretation as a probability. OK, what can now happen? Which cases are possible? First of all, we can assume that the state F0 is in this pure point space. What do we expect then? Yeah, we expect that if we um, send our particle to the target, for example, here's my target, and I send the particle towards this target, then in some sense it will be um, yeah, on a trajectory around this target. So it might move in such a way. And in physics, we call this situation a bound state. Yeah, so for F0 and HPP, um, we expect to have a bound state uh, behaving like this. What can also be possible? Second uh, case is that um, F0 is in HAC. And then it could be possible that if we have the target here and we send our particle to this target, then it might behave like this. It can be deflected. So we have an incoming direction and then we have the interaction with the potential and finally deflection in this sense. This is what we call a scattering state. And number three, F0 is in HSC. Yeah, and this is the case that uh, we do not really want because in this case, heuristically speaking, the particle cannot really decide whether to stay near the target or whether to leave this region. Yeah, so a behavior like this could be possible. Yeah, so the particle cannot really decide what to do. And we, of course, hope that um, the space HSC only contains zero. OK, what is now the goal of scattering theory? We have this quantum mechanical particle moving in the potential. For example, we might consider a situation where it is sent towards a target. We know how the solution looks like and um, how we can uh, interpret these integrals here. Yeah, what is now the goal um, of scattering theory? What um, are our aims here? What do we want to do? So the goal is the following, describe Yeah, of course, I should stay, say, of course, that in scattering theory, we are uh, mainly interested with this case two here, of course, yeah, where we have the scattering situation there. So our goal is to describe the asymptotic behavior, describe the asymptotic behavior of the solution E minus I T H applied to F zero. 
this is our initial value for t going to plus or minus infinity in terms of the free dynamics of the free dynamics given by um, the group E minus I T H zero for T and R, where H zero is a self-adjoint realization of the negative Laplace, which can be obtained, for example, by defining minus Laplace on uh, CC infinity, and then you take the closure. Then you obtain a self-adjoint um, version of um, the negative Laplace operator. And our goal is to compare these two dynamics. We have the given dynamics here given by the operator H, which also contains the potential. And we would like to compare this situation to the free dynamics given by the operator H0. This is the main goal of scattering theory. Yeah, what do we need to, um, to have a mathematical approach? We will need the following assumptions. First of all, it's, you will see that it's um, necessary to have that F0 is an H, AC of H. So we need F0 to be in the absolutely continuous subspace. And we also need that the potential decays in the following sense. V of x can be estimated by C times 1 plus the norm of x to the power of minus alpha for x in Rd and alpha positive. Yeah, and you also realize that the Coulomb case is not covered by the setting. Here we would have alpha equal to 1, but we need for our approach alpha to be bigger th than 1. So the Coulomb case is not covered by this approach. This is important to keep in mind. Yeah, and what do we expect? We expect Um, in this setting, that the particle moves freely. For t going to plus or minus infinity. Yeah, because for large t, the particle does not actually see the potential anymore because it is far away from the from the center of um, interaction. And then the potential is almost equal to zero, so we expect that the particle moves freely in the following sense. We thereby mean that there exist vectors f plus minus in the Hilbert space H, such that the norm of exponential of minus i t h f zero minus the exponential of minus i t h zero applied to f plus minus converges to zero for t going to plus or minus infinity. Yeah, this is then meant by um, the, the fact that the particle moves freely then because for large values of t, for the absolute value of t, we have um, a dy dynamics that is given by H0. Yeah? This is meant by this statement here. Yeah, and now we can rewrite this norm here in the following sense. Because of the fact that these groups here are unitary, we can write it as norm F0 minus exponential of ith, exponential of minus ith0 f plus minus. And this motivates um, one essential thing in scattering theory, or one e essential question, which is the existence of the so-called wave operators, existence of wave operators, which we will 
denote by omega plus minus, and they belong to the pair H and H0, and they are given by the strong limits, strong limit for T going to plus or minus infinity, exponential I T H, exponential minus I T H0, and you will see that we will also need to have a projection on the absolutely continuous subspace of H0 here. In our setting, this projection operator is equal to the identity because we are in L2 of RD, and this is um, the minus Laplace operator. This is an exercise. I have it on the exercise sheets. Yeah, so this is not difficult to prove. But um, in general, for the general definition, we will need um, this projection operator here in this expression. Yeah, and then one task uh, in scattering theory is, um, yeah, do these strong limits actually exist? Yeah, motivated from this construction here. So the first important question for the next lectures will be, what can we say about the existence of the wave operators? Yeah, secondly, when we have <clears throat> these operators, one can define a scattering operator S, which is defined by omega plus star omega minus. And um, what this operator, heuristically speaking, uh, is uh, doing is that it maps the direction of arrival to the direction of deflection. Yeah, so uh, in some sense it maps the F minus to the F plus, if you want. And the second important question in the scattering theory is the question of the completeness of the wave operators. And we will um, see several definitions of this notion. Basically, we mean by that that the range of omega plus and minus is equal to the absolutely continuous subspace uh, of H with respect to the operator H. Yeah? And these are the two essential things that we are concerned with in scattering theory. First of all, the existence of the so-called wave operators, um, the existence of um, this strong limit here, and the second question, the question of completeness. And in the next lectures, I would like to um, develop a mathematical theory for these two questions in detail. And step by step, we will also come to some results and um, see which um, applications this has for physical systems.